question. I, I just wanted briefly to say welcome to everybody. This is going to be a really exciting event, I hope. I'm sure it will. And just to say a few brief words about our two speakers. Um, Stella Val Valermea is a professor of excellence in philosophy at the uh, Complutense University of Madrid. She's a main contributor to the emergent field of philosophy of birth. Um, and she has an expertise in epistemology and feminism and her works address the philosophical relation between knowledge and e emancipation. Um, she's published on capacity and rationality in birth care, obstetric violence and the language of birth from an epistemic perspective. She is the coordinator of the Philosophy of Birth Network in the Collaborating Center for Values-Based Practice at St. Catherine's College, Oxford, my alma mater, as it happens. Um, she leads a program of research on the philosophy of birth at the uh, Complutense University of Madrid. She's a Marie S. Curie Fellow of, at the University of Oxford, and in, in that capacity led the research project Controversies in Childbirth from Epistemology to Practices, um, funded by the European Commission, and the principal investigator of an earlier project, Philosophy of Birth, Rethinking the Origin from Medical Humanities, and in that capacity organized an interdisciplinary team of philosophers, health practitioners, and social scientists around childbirth and birth care. And at the moment, she's um, an associate faculty member in philosophy at the University of Oxford, um, uh, serves as a member of the Steering and Gender Committee of the International Federation of Philosophical Associations. Also, as I should mention, features an option for the, the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies uh, Master's course here at Oxford. So Stella will be our first speaker, and I'll say a little bit more about the order of proceedings in a moment. But I also wanted to introduce our other speaker. Um, Sarah Cohen Shabbat is Associate Professor at the Women's and Gender Studies Program at the University of Haifa. Uh, she spe specializes in phenomenology, feminist philosophy, and philosophies of the body. And her present research and publications address feminist philosophical perspectives on childbirth and the maternal embodied subject. And more recently, her uh, research has focused on the phenomenon of obstet obstetric violence as gender violence. And she's published several papers looking at the subject um, from different philosophical pers perspectives in journals such as Human Studies, Feminist Theory, the European Journal of uh, Women's Studies in Hypatia. And at the, at the moment, she is an academic vi visitor at the Faculty of Philosophy here at Oxford. So welcome, very welcome to both of you. The way we're going to do it, um, Stella is going to begin um, by uh, with, with a talk entitled Birthing, colon, Vindicating Visceral Bodies Philosophically. And I think um, she's gonna talk for about 45 minutes. And then Stella, oh, sorry, then, um, Sarah will give a talk with the wonderful title, Keeping Birthing Bodies Grotesque or Resisting Obstetric Violence Through Crip Phenomenology. She'll talk for perhaps half an hour. That stage will probably have a mini break just for people who want to go and have a drink of water or visit, you know. Um, and then we'll have some time left over for discussion. So. Brilliant. So, Stella. Um, so, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Hatterin Morris, for your welcoming words. Thank you, Pelaya Gulumari, for organizing the event. And thank you, everyone, for being here with, with us. Um, yeah, uh, it's exciting. It's really exciting. It's not just words. 
to talk on the philosophy of birth at the Faculty of Philosophy, in the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Oxford. And um, yeah, Berkeley, vindicating a visceral body philosophically. How to talk about birth philosophically? How renewed attention to the birth body in philosophy helps pave the way for a rethinking of birth beyond biology? How does this reflection contribute to naming, elaborating, making visible concrete aspects of human life in their connection to gender, race, and sexuality? How we battle to make our birthing experience communic communicable in a way that does not underestimate the experience and allows us to see it from multiple perspectives. I would like to present a piece of creative thinking because yes, I think philosophical thinking is creative that illustrates, informs, or questions how we represent the visceral body when we give voice to experiences that are graphic, shocking, bloody, unseen, and I would add, unheard. Even birth is a good case study for all of this. So the title of my talk is my attempt to answer these questions. And the title suggests that interpreting, representing, affirming the visceral body in and with the philosophical discourse is possible. But what exactly is needed? Well, not only a philosophical representation or interpretation of the visceral burden body, but a vindication of that body and its language. So let's face it, birth, giving birth has its language. And as any language, it also has its politics, its hermeneutics, and its way to find its way. Um, I forgot to pass the slides. So we are here. And at this moment, I would like to do a quiz. Mm -hmm. Would you like to help me? Mm -hmm. Super, thank you so much. <laughs> I would like to play 10 short audios, very short. You will hear sounds of labor and you would hear sounds of orgasms. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to please try to guess which one is which. Do not just guess, write down. Your guesses, please. And uh, each of the obvious lasts only a few seconds. So it all will go quick. And the whole listening will take three minutes. So that's one. Ready? Yeah, go. Um, before we, 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 we. Okay, that was the first audio. And for those who are online, please also write your guesses. And if you want, at the end, you share your guesses uh, in the chat. I don't know how anonymous this would be, but I really wouldn't remember. <laughs> um, so second audio. Quick. Um, third audio. Wait, wait, it's not showing on the screen here, but well, let's just move. Oh. Oh, sorry, 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 it has to do with
because I'm dealing with different buttons and clicks. Um, the last one was the fourth audio. Is it all right until here? Yes. It's. Let me see if I get more uh, clear with the buttons. We go for number five now. Mm -hmm. Number six. Goes quick, huh? Mm, but interesting. Number seven. Oh. <laughs> Number eight. Oh. Only two more to go. Really, it's only three, four, five seconds. It looks maybe more, but. Oh. And your last chance, number 10. Ah, 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 But that was it. We have ten audios. And um, would you like to share your guesses? Also, <laughs> those who are online, if you would like to just write it in the in the in the chat. Let me see if I get this back. Um, I don't know where the presentation is. Thank you. Yes. So, Lovely. yes, yes, please. <clears throat> we have to move quickly because they we don't have much time. Birth. They were all, they could all be birth. They could all be birth. They could all be birth. Good. Thank you. Or they could all be orgasms. <laughs> or they could all be orgasms. Okay, so when, when he was there, I was like, oh, he's going to be seen. Okay, like, my is way older than us. Perfect. Perfect. Had the dog not been there, huh? Maybe, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else wants to just let me see. I, I thought the early one sounded more like birth, and then I completely changed my mind and thought the later one sounded more like orgasm. So I, I don't know whether it was a mental shift inside my own head that my thinking kind of evolved. Mm -hmm. Let me see in the chat is disabled, only able to type here in Q&A. Um, I would not deal with the problems, the technical problems at the same time that I give my talk. It, Sorry about this. It does matter because people can, can type uh, under Q&A. So please, uh, people that are online, they tell me you can type under Q&A. Please do it that way. Thank you so much. So here. Um, it's interesting even the way you phrase it. They could be orgasm, they could be labor or birth, they, or you said, or they could be uh, orgasms. Well, they could even be both. The mm -hmm. or is always <laughs> um, that you change along the way because something goes and then makes you shift or that you thought it was going to be easy and then, well, it started and this and that, and someone else said uh, something, something else. 
this is the point. Well, for those who want to know the answers, <laughs> the first five was were actual recordings of orgasms. Excuse me. Wait. The first five are childbirths, and the last five are orgasms. For the sake of they are actual recordings, but as you've seen it, or imagine it, or uh, guessed, uh, there are many things to be said or to be thought. So the point is not so much. Um, I thought all orgasms other than two, five and eight. This is also like, thank you very much. And um, so um, the point is, not so much whether we are right or wrong in our uh, guesses, but that we question ourselves, our perceptions, our interpretations, our expectations. How have we got here? How do we get to a situation where we usually know more about how orgasms sound than how birth might sound? How is it that we've heard much more about how some areas of life uh, sound or can sound than others. Of course, of course, orgasms can sound very differently and they can also not sound at all. The same goes with birth. Birth can sound in different tunes or can be silent, that we all uh, know. Again, that's not so much the, the point. But how is it that we have little knowledge about their possible similarity? And the little knowledge depends on biographies and depends on different situations. Why we have expelled birth from the sphere of sexuality? Just because it often takes place in hospital or birth centers, perhaps. Much could be said about the history of ideas and female body and the way we have constructed our idea of what birth or orgasms are. Feminist thinkers and philosophers have already built a huge corpus for us to study, learn, and enjoy. That would be a content of another talk. I have written something in a paper entitled Reasoning from the Uterus, Casanova, Agency and Philosophy of Birth. In any case, what we have heard Uh, mm -hmm. What we have heard are certainly visceral bodies, women living and expressing their visceral bodies. One would even be tempted to say their visceral minds. These sounds are part of what I call the language of birth. For birthing women do not only bear children, they also bear language. That language is the bridge between nature and culture. Interpreting that language is what allows us to cross the boundaries between biology and sociology or society. So how do we interpret those sounds? How do we interpret the language of birth? Well, let me say it up front. In relation to birth, to its language, hermeneutics and politics, we seem to face a dilemma. Are we to interpret labor as a process ruled only by the visceral body? If ruled by the visceral body, those sounds are just that, sounds, cries, screams. Or is there any alternative? Shall we construct it? A hint. It might be that those sounds have meaning, that they are phoné, as the Greeks used to like to, to say, in the sense that they convey, they convey a meaning, they convey connotation, significance. They mean something. And the dilemma entails a danger that acknowledging or emphasizing the role of the visceral body in birth leads to diminish our rights in the birthing room. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. As you know, most of our society, most of our social contracts are based upon mental capacity or rationality. That is why conceiving the birthing body as a visceral body has its risks, for it may lead us then to quickly conclude that the birthing woman is not an incapacity. While, we, while if we push instead the understanding of a birthing subject as a 
rational subject, we might be led to suppress what is characteristic of many burden situations that alter the state of body and mind. So the dilemma is either the burden woman is taken to be in full capacity and therefore able to take, maintain, and ch or change decisions, grant or not grant consent, and act as a fully entitled agent, or she's taken to be in a special altered state of body-mind that puts her in a situation of non-capacity and perhaps non-agency in relation to decisions, informed consent, and full entitlement, fully entitled citizenship. For me, the key to philosophize about birth is to bear in mind the dilemma and its risks. And it seems to me that the exit of, to the dilemma is to acknowledge both the role that the birthing visceral body on the one hand and the rational body mind or the sense of meaningful body mind on the other play or can play the different roles that they play or can play during labor and childbirth. We should take seriously that the woman giving birth stands on the frontier between nature and culture. We should avoid so much the biological determinism as cultural determinism. I don't really like the shoot here. Where I speak in Spanish, I would delete the shoot. I don't like the kind of prescription, but okay. In other words, how could narratives be constructed that place birth in the circle of physiological and significant action? Not only significant, significant. Finding words to describe Finding words to describe labor and childbirth, exploring a language of birth is crucial to understanding uh, our conceptual model of birth and also to understanding birth care models or models of birth care that take care of those giving birth and being born. So let's do it. Let's do philosophy of birth. And let's look again at the language of birth. What do those sounds mean? What has to have happened previously for a woman to enter in a state of whatever, altered state of mind, you know, in the state where she sounds this way? I would like to explore what a philosophical vindication of the bird in this body, this new logos for genos, might look like. Um, it's this is the dilemma, and here we are. Vindication, what does it mean? In dictionaries, you find the action of clearing someone of blame or suspicion, as in, I intend to work to ensure my full vindication. Or you also find that it can be proof that someone or something is right, reasonable, or justified, as in, the results were interpreted as an indication of the company's policy. Synonyms, defense, acquittal, clearance, proof, explanation, and it goes on. Antonyms, charge, conviction, condemnation, recrimination, accusation, and so So an act of vindicating is a justification or defense against denial or censure. But it is clear, vindication comes in when something has gone wrong. And that is exactly how feminists use and have used the term as demand, request, claim, complaint. Remember Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, claim and vindication of the rights of women and the echoes of her roots in the Enlightenment. Women are rational too. In my talk, vindicating means exactly that, points to what has not yet been granted, but it is fair to grant. Birding, vindicating a visceral body philosophically, implies acknowledging first that birth is related to our entrails, of course, and two, that such fact has not yet been properly understood or incorporated by philosophy. And what particularly will I vindicate? That childbirth is the founding moment of how society treats and understands human beings. For childbirth concerns not just women's bodies, but everybody, since everybody is born. So studying childbirth matters not only for improving the conditions of women's labor in childbirth, but also for understanding the 
innermost secret of the entire social order, as Marx would have it, many other, just the idea. So in this sense, philosophy can explore the language of birth because, because it can explore the systems of meanings out of which our tradition comes, placing birth as a meaningful, significant, not only significative action is what philosophy of birth is about. Visceral, what does visceral mean? This birth from the moment of social order. In anatomy, it means relating to the visceral, the internal organs of the body, from Latin, visceralis, viscous, inner parts of the body. Etymology shows also that it has always been read as affecting inward feelings. It is interesting to remember that throughout history, the bowels were regarded as the seat of emotion. So what is related to the viscera was associated to emotions, and it is still so. A visceral body brings echoes of a body that displays emotions. And in many dictionaries, visceral is defined as resulting from a strong feelings or intuition rather than careful thought, as spontaneous, for example. He had a visceral reaction to the sight of blood, you know, arising from deeply felt feelings as opposed to conscious intellect. Synonyms, emotional, emotive, feeling, intuitive, so many, instinctive. Visceral is what is close, near, fond, deep to the heart and feelings, also touching, moving, and daring. That is why visceral can also be linked to what is the substance or central part of something, the heart, the nucleus, the crux, or the intrinsic nature, the core, the essence, the root. So we have that visceral denotes the internal in the sense of what relates to bowels, insights, guts, instincts, emotions, and in all those senses, visceral can be used to describe the actions of the womb, the actions of the uterus. But why do we never think of visceral as applying to the brain? After all, the brain is also an internal organ. I don't know for you, but for me, it's an internal <laughs> organ of the body. It might not be like soon things are going in different directions, <laughs> but and the talk is going on now, 2023. Why visceral is usually taken to be based on deep feeling and emotional reactions rather than on reason or thought? What does it mean and imply to play and continue to believe these oppositions? Why could not visceral, if related to our inner parts and emotions, point us also at behavior that is conscious, deliberate, intentional, voluntary, willful, prepared, intended, volitional, refined, calculated, designed. You go on, I have many. I hope looking at these descriptions of the roots of action helps us to understand why I want to look at the birthing body as a visceral body, not only because we birth with our entrails, sure, also for the time being, but also because Birthing with our entrails means all of the above. Birthing from the core, the root, the insights, yes. And finally, precisely, because we also birth with our capacity, our reasoning skills, our cultural paths, our thoughts, our will, our intentions, our calculus, our volition, our desires, our fears, our wishes, our, our expectations, our biographical decisions and experiences. We birth with everything that matters to us, that is dear to us. In short, you could say with our values. So the challenge is how to talk about the birthing visceral body while keeping the agency that is without introducing a loss of capacity, reasoning or decision ability that might lead to a wrong model of birth care. Bearing in mind the dilemma and the risks, let's vindicate this visceral body philosophically. So, a note of the use of sex language in the rest of the talk that I will be delivering. I recognize that the focus on women and in particular, and particularly on cisgender women has been seen as exclusionary in recent uh, times. And I have chosen to discuss 
pregnant subjects as women in most of my writings, and I would do it in this talk. I agree with those like Rival and Bully and others in the importance of using sex language in the area of female reproduction and reproductive justice. As they phrase it, we should find ways, this I'm quoting, forward for those who are pregnant, birthing and breastfeeding, but who do not identify as women or mothers. And this can be made explicit through inclusivity statements or definitions, but we should also not ban the use of women or mothers in our communication around birth matters. So that's why I will sometimes be using people and human beings, but also I will continue to use and talk openly of women. Birth matters matter, and they matter philosophically. I work on the philosophy of birth. As you see, I use the tools of philosophy to analyze representation and practices around childbirth. My thesis is that to reorient philosophical conversation toward birth and specifically to the origin of our lives in the female body produces a shift. Once we take that turn, many of the tales about our origin truly become old tales. Are we already imagining this new genealogy, a new language of birth, a new logos for genos? That's literally what genealogy means. Can we philosophically, medically, obstetrically represent and vindicate this new genealogy? Every human life begins with gestation and birth. However, in the thought and culture with which I am more familiar, Western thought, Delivery and birth have received considerably less attention than death and mortality. And some of us, women philosophers and feminists, have criticized this imbalance, rescuing delivery and birth from its state of omission. The philosophy of birth constitutes this growing uh, field of contemporary feminist critical thought to which I add my own voice. Uh, and I pay special attention to the moment and experience of giving birth rather than to the fact of being born. And the reason for this is that in contrast to the history of philosophy, I defend that the birthing woman is not only an agent of experience, but a philosophical authority. That is why I focus on the epistemology of birth, namely on the nature, origin, and limits of the knowledge produced by or related to giving birth. Birth care brings fascinating philosophical questions to the fore. Is the person in labor a subject with full rights in practice as well as in theory? Can they exercise their autonomy in a situation of maximum vulnerability? How do we understand the incredible lucidity and awareness that characterizes giving birth? How do agency, capacity, and pain intertwine during and between contractions? Who of all involved? as the final say. So birth and birth care pose key questions relating to knowledge, freedom, gender, and what it means to be a human being. I started using this, these ideas of philosophy of birth to explain what it was going on and what I was doing, this uh, looking at birth as uh, an using philosophy of birth as an innovative approach to women's rights. How we understand our origin and the practices that bring us into being reveal our humanity, I believe. I could even defend it. The lived experience of birthing women and their situated knowledge challenge widely held assumptions about rationality, about what it is to be a birthing woman and what it is to have agency and capacity in the delivery suit. In my research, I tried to analyze how much of birth care continues to underestimate the capacity of a woman in labor to behave rationally, that is, with reasons. With my approach, I would like to offer this uh, new genealogy that uh, sets sail from the basic premise that and um, birthing women are fully entitled citizens. And to construct this alternative uh, genealogy, I target obstetrics, I target midwifery, 
as an empirical and symbolic space where contemporary thought reformulates the discourse around our origin. If we would have more time, I would be asking, what do you think are the science of origin? And usually audience says physics, theology, uh, myths. There are many different ways to answer this. I really think today obstetrics is the science for origin. It's what is is in our in our in our society is one of the very very important fields that imagines and describes what origin uh, is. Um, a glance at uh, the contemporary science concerned with genos shows that obstetrics all too frequently continues to legitimize the use and abuse of women's bodies and justify the rights violations that many women experience at a critical point in their life. To understand this, we need to go into the documents and the reports, and uh, that would take a very interesting uh, time. Um, and again, I'm going behind the, the slides, but here uh, sure. my colleague uh, Sarah Cohen Shabot will also talk about uh, obstetric violence later on, and we distributed the time so that I am now looking at it. I just would like to point out the fact that the 2019 United Nations report on women on violence on women uh, focused on obstetric violence and concluded that it happens around the world and across socioeconomic levels. That is, it happens everywhere to everyone. It can happen. So we hear it. I've never felt so irrelevant in my life. No one advocated for me on that day. It's hard to believe, but that's what, uh, that many women are shocked that this can happen and that this can happen in a very particular moment in their life, in a very important uh, moment in their life. Of course, there are many caring professionals, many, many good practitioners. Um, who are compassionate and who follow good practice, both things. But I will be talking today about situations when this is not the case, about when and why women's rights are frequently breached during childbirth. Um, I believe philosophy of birth is, is um, useful to challenge potentially toxic narratives that have major impact on birth care. Within maternity care, there is a fundamental tension, which is that while everybody is clear that choice, autonomy, and agency are fundamental in theory and the law, in practice, this is often, if not regularly, not enacted. So women's experience speaks to an uncomfortable truth, namely that autonomy in decision-making about their body and health during labor is far from common place. And in my research, I examine theories of female rationality and their application to people in labor to uncover the views that act as barriers to establishing values-based practice in obstetrics and midwifery. I have a, an, an article co-authored with Dr. Uh, Brenda Kelly on this topic. So that's also uh, a place where we develop these, these ideas. Stereotypes can play out in our unconscious bias that women in labor are irrational. And indeed, the most enduring and probably most influential stereotype about women giving birth is that they are not rational, that they behave irrationally. From this perspective, the debate on women's rationality choices and decision-making in childbirth is a pressing battle. <laughs> At the stake is nothing less than women's entitlement to full citizenship. Consciously or unconsciously, professionals do not always engage in true shared decision making. It is them who have to engage in decision, in shared decision making. Making the decision is not for them to, to take according to the law. Um, so consciously or unconsciously, professionals do not always engage in true shared decision making with women during labor because they take them as to be obviously not in full capacity. And why are women in labor obviously, please, is the obviously what I'm interested in, not in full capacity. 
because their being in an altered state of body and consciousness is taken to deeply affect their capacity to retain and recall information, balance it, and make decisions. Hence, what they say is taken to not necessarily convey what they mean, nor what they need, nor what is good for them and their babies. In short, women subject to uterine influence do not reason well. I sometimes use this expression, when the uterus coming, comes in the door, reason goes out. When the uh, uterus comes in, yeah, through the window or whatever it is, reason just goes out of, of, the, of the room. But it's a, a, a paper that has the sentence in proper English. Uh, in what follows, I take a particular approach to explaining how we can protect birthing people's rights during childbirth. To this end, I focus on the role of implicit bias and gender stereotypes. So I have to move and will be on, on, on time. The capacity of a woman, of, of a person in labor. It is well known that throughout history, philosophers have underestimated women's capacity for rationality. They developed ideas and conceptions of reasons which were either not designed with women in mind or directly excluded them. This problematic history has both reflected and contributed to systems of injustice, and we continue to be affected by the practical consequences of these historical narratives. <clears throat> Understanding our epistemic obligations is thus crucial to discussing the role of implicit bias in birth care. People can act on the basis of prejudice and stereotypes without intending to do so. Put plainly, we know what we think even if we don't know why we think it. These stereotypes can be observed very clearly in our field of study. The mental capacity of the woman in labor. A person in labor far from embodies the typical or ideal characteristics of a rational agent, but rationality, which relates to reason, is more than comparing a stock market values to decide where to invest your money. The woman in labor who decides, for example, that she wants to get up and move around is indeed rational, since to adopt an appropriate birthing position, she has evaluated the resources and options available to her. Everyday philosophy calls this practical reasoning, which involves life experience. I'm reminded of the film documentaries that view chimpanzees piling, I always use this sentence, this example. Chimpanzees piling up boxes to reach bananas as proof of cognitive learning process. While the decisions that a woman takes to find a good birthing position are not often regarded as a cognitive process. How is that? Chimpanzees show a spark of intelligence by climbing on boxes, but the woman moving around the label is simply following her animal instincts. The title of this section is Cry is a Cry is a Cry is a Cry. And it's a paraphrasis of a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose by this time. The sentence helps me introduce another example of a stereotypical thinking in the case of a woman of labor, in labor, the interpretation of her cry. A laboring woman's cry is considered non-rational behavior, a sign that she has lost control. However, it may be that a woman, in, a, a woman crying out during labor is being more rational, more prudent in the Aristotelian sense than we think. Ultimately, perhaps her cry is premeditated. After all, a woman in labor is not a being from an other world. She's keenly aware that our culture interprets the heart rendering cry as a paradigm for total loss of control. You only need to watch the films. Consequently, in our context, many women think carefully before releasing loud cries. For this reason, it takes courage to emit the first cry, to try it out, to see what happens, and if it seems good, to continue. But it may be simply that a birthing woman knows her cry will help her because she has learned that guttural sounds emitted from one's throat open the birth canal. There is a direct connection between the muscles of the throat and those of the pelvis. Opera singers also use their pelvic floor to reach the highest or lowest notes. If this is the case, we will need to start saying that women may learn in 
antenatal classes and conversations that crying out may help them. When the woman arrives, when the moment arrives, they try it and it helps, so they continue. They choose, test, confirm, peer method. Why are we so reluctant to acknowledge what they do is rational? Ludwig Wittgenstein explained that the meaning of a sign cannot be innately interpreted. Rather, a sign needs the context of social practices to realize its meaning. For example, the color red does not mean stop. It only means stop if we have traffic lights and uh, traffic laws. A cry during labor need not be any different. The cry is a sign for something. The patriarchal context interprets, interprets it as a lack of control, but the interpretative context may be different. We may read the guttural sound as a way of maintaining the rhythm of breathing and working through pain. Among humans, a cry can have many interpretations, an order, a limit, a lament, a vindication, relief, impact, mantra, an expression of pleasure, to mention a few. Why should the labor and cry not also be an intentional action to open an organ and facilitate the entry to a unique existential space? Of course, this is very important. There are contexts in which the birthing cry means something else, which is why it is so impo important to remember that the cry is a sign, is a sign, is a sign. A cry can, for example, signify that the birthing woman is expressing her fear or anxiety, her complaint or protest. It might be the way she asks for an epidural. There are other explanations too. Further on during labor, a cry might See this being rational behavior in the sense of being premeditated as a means to an end. And with lack, behavior which is started for this kind of cultural reasons enters a distinct and interesting phase that I will refer to for simplicity's sake as physiological. Once a woman has tested the virtues of her cries, once she's confident of its value and has used it to transition to the next stage, her screen might become something else a tool for navigation, mantra for concentration. That cry would mean that she feels safe and she's landing or she's on planet birth, is usually called. In those contacts, screaming during labor does not mean being out of herself, but truly being in herself. Think of soldiers on the battlefield. Initially, battle cries may be chants designed to motivate, then shouts to encourage speed, later for focus, and finally, the sound of the enemy being targeted. We would not routinely consider soldiers as behaving irrationally when they let out this final cry. We would be more inclined to think of their final sound as fulfilling a function, an appropriate means to a desired end. Let us compare this with how is still in some contexts the burning woman's sons are taken to mean just one thing, that she has lost control and even her capacity. Or consider the way in some cultures, the pain for, of grieving for lost ones is signified by silent behavior when in public, while in others, mourning is accompanied by or even requires heart rendering screens. Why are we more inclined to think of burning language as less cultural than say mourning language? As humans, birthing women do the same things or similar things to each other. However, the same scream has different meanings depending on who, where, when, for what purpose, I don't go on. The scream is utter. We must challenge the university of birthing behavior to allow different and better interpretations in context. The scream of a laboring woman is tuned in a specific culture and context and should be interpreted within it. To reduce the multiplicity of meanings and application of her burden sounds to a simplistic, she does not have capacity, is a sign of patriarchy. We need to address the multiplicity of voices in childbirth, their autonomy and their agency. And that's what it means to say that the burden woman's cry is a sign, is a sign, is a sign. And so I finish. In the context of the philosophy of birth, I see knowledge as a tool for action. Identifying women's testimonies of violence as rooted in situated knowledge has philosophical significance. It means we recognize the birthing woman has the epistemic privilege to transition from a personal to a universal or general sphere of interest. 
It also means she's equipped with epistemic resources to interpret her needs, claims, fears, and hopes. How we understand our origin and the practices that bring us into being reveals our humanity. The lived experiences of women and their situated knowledge challenge widely held assumptions about rationality. The philosophy of birth enables us to navigate the stormy waters of contemporary obstetric practice towards a new and radical logos for genos. And that is an embodied feminist genealogy that could not only redress imbalances of gender, but also address life and happiness. And I really think we think as bodies, not only about them. If you are interested in following the conversation, apart from what we will be talking today, please come and join us for the um, 5th of July event at St. Catherine's when we are uh, launching on the 5th of July, 10 a.m., 10.30 to 12.30 at St. Catherine's College, Oxford, but it will be hybrid, so you can also register online. We will launch the Birth of Birth Network uh, for philosophers of birth and practitioners and anyone uh, interested and women's advocates and anyone interested. Thank you so much. So, um, there are some, some uh, questions in the chat that we will address after uh, Professor Sarah Cohen Shabot gives her talk. Yeah. The screen is shared or it's not shared, I think. Okay. Oh. If you just start the slideshow now, it should share. Stop sharing. It's sharing online, we can see it online. So if you just start the slideshow. Okay. Is there a little X up in the corner of the, the chat box, the question? Yes. yes. Oh, there we go. Excellent. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much um, to all of you for being here. And um, this is this is work in progress. So this is my new project, and it's based on, on many of the things I have done, even in the in the um, past, and my work on the grotesque body, which is like from the beginning of my my career. Um, so I, I I brought it now to. to to the discussion on obstetric violence and birth. And um, I would just start where I start with these um, two pictures with, which I think um, portray in a very, um, in a very complete way, uh, what is obstetric violence. And so this first one, is uh, from the from an Israeli series reality series called Baby Boom, which is a series in which uh, births are filmed uh, in hospitals, like real real births, and so this is the prom the promotional material, and it's not I mean it's not a joke. They really they really brought it as a promotional material for the for the program, and we can perfectly see here. I mean, this doctor is real. I know him. I was even in a conference with him. And we can see who are the protagonists of birth, right? Uh, and I, I think it's excellent to see and even the, the aura uh, around this doctor. Uh, the midwives and nurses are there. The baby is there. The partner is there. And that's it, more or less. So, so of course, one of the um, 
uh, one of the main characteristics of or definitions of obstetric violence is this disappearance of women and this uh, dehumanization, of course, of, 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 of women, of working women. Um, the second one is this, um, which is also a classic for me. And it's, um, um, yes, at least you have a healthy baby, right? And this is what many women uh, hear after hard births or uh, even traumatic births. And they are silenced by this phrase, uh, uh, which of course puts all the attention on the healthy baby and healthy mother and nothing uh, to what happened in between. So uh, I think this is a good also uh, pic pictorial definition of obstetric violence. And from here, I will start with my, my text. Um, so uh, feminist perspectives on how and why obstetric violence happens occupy a central place in the recent research on the subject. What is still missing from the research, however, and demands to be studied is the link between the female body, especially the female birthing body, as grotesque and monstrous, and obstetric violence as a tool for domesticating and cleaning that body. Looking at the birthing body and the phenomenon of obstetric violence through the lenses of theories of the grotesque, themselves connected to theories of dirt, disgust, the abject and the monstrous, <clears throat> and creep phenomenologies, phenomenologies that discuss disability, disorientation, and abnormality as emancipatory spaces, rather than spaces to be avoided or escaped from, will allow us to illuminate the ways in which obstetric violence is understood and even offer new practical ways to tackle it. <clears throat> so what kind of violence is obstetric violence? Obstetric violence, violence performed against women given birth in medicalized settings has been widely recognized as a structural phenomenon affecting innumerable women globally and systematically. And one that is in that it is in urgent need of being addressed and solved. Lately, even official global organizations, and Stella mentioned that, such as the WHO and the UN, have released clear statements about obstetric violence, calling for immediate action on the part of countries and medical institutions to tackle the problem of pervasive obstetric violence worldwide. Research on the subject has grown exponentially over the last decade, mainly in the fields of health and social sciences. One of the Excuse main- Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Online, we can only see the screen has frozen. Please, could you stop sharing and then reshare so that we can hope the slides then move on again? Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, I think we're back on course. We can see a slide with obstetric violence at the top. So hopefully we're back on course now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, research on the subject has grown exponentially over the last decade, mainly in the fields of health and social sciences. One of the main findings of this research is that obstetric violence constitutes gender violence, not just medical violence. Thus, because it is gender violence, research from the perspective of feminist theories has, has proved to be crucial in trying to understand the reasons behind the, behind the phenomenon and the myriad ways in which it harms birthing women while making itself almost invisible, normalized to the point that it is often unrecognizable as violence. Feminist phenomenology and feminist epistemology have been used to try to disentangle the mechanisms that nurture and enable obstetric violence in the form of practices that seem normal, necessary, or inevitable, both in the eyes of medical staff and more pressingly, even in those of birthing women themselves. And I have published a lot of research on this too. Feminist phenomenology has con contributed to showing how the birthing body is a rebellious, subversive body a prototype, prototype of the I can body, a potent embodied subjectivity, and one that frequently behaves in ways considered unfeminine according to patriarchal standards because of the power, strength, loudness, and expansiveness that it displays. 
Obstetric violence thus has appeared as a tool through which these bodies are put back in their place. To obstetric violence is a subversive body that is characteristic of labor, is dominated, silenced, and restricted. In other words, it is made, made feminine again, sometimes through severe violence, even reported as torture. Laboring bodies, however, are not, are not just strong, loud, powerful bodies. They are also vulnerable bodies in need of solidarity and care, though not in the form of paternalistic impositions, of course. They are also bodies that belong to the abnormal due to their changing form and capacities. They are unexpected, sometimes disoriented, ambiguous bodies that can be suggestive of monstrosity. Birthing subjects are ir irremediably clearly embodied and their embodiment is present as fleshy, smelly, and replete, replete with fluids, dirt, or contamination, frequently including feces and urine and always including blood. And as such, they are surrounded by shame and fear. One of the most illuminating studies of birth as dirty is Callaghan. Callaghan explains the history of birth as a dirty zone, along with the social, political, and cultural function, both past and present, that is served by defining birth that way. The strengthening of the power of the medical establishment and its ab absolute control over birth. The medical establishment, Callaghan shows, has deemed birth to be dirty, mainly so that the establishment can be the one to sanitize it to take on the primary responsibility for making it hygienic. While an, while an important part of the history is that at least in its beginnings, this medical attempt to sanitize birth actually increased infections and deaths. This is also how the medical system displaced midwives from the birth scene by declaring them too to be dirty. In short, Callaghan argues what is behind the need to cleanse birth is power relations, the diminishment of midwife's power, and even more critically, the diminishment of the power of the laboring world. Birthing bodies are thus prototypes of Kristeva's object, and therefore frequently escaped from both by the medical staff and by laboring women themselves, because they are grotesque bodies in need of being cleaned, sanitized, and saved from their own monstrosity. The birth activist and home midwife Jacqueline ba Baylistrud <clears throat> writes, for, for instance, oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. as long as the dangerous, sickly female body appears scarier to us, than the vast number of serious injuries caused by labor interventions, patriarchy's medicalized imprisonment will falsely appear safer to childbirthing, to childbearing women. <clears throat> Thus, I argue, obstetric violence cannot be truly understood without addressing the grotesqueness of laboring bodies, their inherent uncanniness and unexpectedness, and the challenge that all of this poses to the ambitions of standardization, normalcy, order, cleanliness, clean, cleanliness, and predictability that are paradigmatic of medicalization. A new phenomenological analysis examining these features of birthing bodies is much needed in order to add a different perspective to the research into the causes behind the phenomenon of obstetric violence and shed new light on these investigations. A crypt phenomenology a phenomenology that challenges the conceptions of normal, abnormal, and able, disabled bodies and places, will create space for a novel discussion on obstetric violence and the strategies for tackling, tackling it. So the birthing body as grotesque. Although birthing bodies in the sense that they perform a Although birthing bodies, in the sense that they perform a rather normal physiological function, are not abnormal, they are abnormal compared to what is expected from normal bodies in everyday life. Birthing bodies are grotesque bodies. 
They change in form. They are fluid, expansive, and both comic and monstrous. Their openings are exaggerated and dynamic. They are bodies that go out and into the world and that receive or meet the world through their orifices. Bakhtin describes grotesque embodiment precisely in this way. Yes, he writes, the grotesque body is not separated from the rest of the world. It is not a closed, complete unit. It is unfinished, outgrows itself, transgresses its own limits. The stress it's laid on these parts, on those parts of the body that are open to the outside world, that is the parts through which the world enters the body or emerges from it, or through which the body itself goes out to meet the world. This means that the emphasis is on the apertures or the convexities or on various ramifications and offshoots, the open mouth, the genital organs, the breast, the phallus, the pot belly, the nose. The body discloses its essence as the principle of growth, which exceeds its own limits only in copulation, pregnancy, childbirth, the throes of death, eating, drinking, and defecation. This is the ever unfinished, ever creating body. This is Bertin's. <clears throat> Grotesque bodies are thus disruptive bodies par excellence, subversive bodies that challenge the norm, though not always through strength or extraordinary capacities, Frequently, it is through the opposite. They are hybrid bodies that often includes, include the formations that create disabilities, such as limbs and body parts that are too big or too small, disproportional and thus dysfunctional, or that present a mixture of incompatible embodied features. Different theories of the grotesque body as transgressive, such as those of Harpam, Kaiser, but mainly Bakhtin's, shall inform a novel analysis of the birthing body as challenging medical discipline and power, not by being an extraordinary potent able body, but in its character as a non-normative creep entity. Though this analysis, through this analysis, the phenomenon of obstetric violence might be understood in a different light as the very predictable response of the medicalized system to the unbearable anxiety caused by the lack of control, dysfunctionality, disorientation, and contamination that grotesque birthing bodies bring with themselves. <clears throat> okay, and about creep phenomenology and embracing disorientation. Within the field of disability studies, creep phenomenology has recently emerged as a form of critical phenomenology that looks at the experiences of disabled bodies and subjects and of people living with physical or and mental illnesses. This new phenomenological research does not aim to recognize these bodies are pertaining to some new normal, that is to expand the notion of normalcy, so to speak, in order to include all bodies by bringing them to the same table, but rather to emphasize dysfunctionality sometimes even presented as a kind of monstrosity instead of erasing or diluting it. The purpose is to argue for the disabled body and the disabled subject as possessing certain virtues and to analyze disability as a condition from which new insights into experience and the lived world might emerge. Bringing creep phenomenology to the fore can contribute to the depathologization of the birthing body and promote a reading to which it can be approached as an em emancipatory space instead. One of the main goals of creep phenomenology has been to embrace disorientation. And this we can see in mainly in Harbin's work. To argue for the ethical, aesthetic, and epistemic value of being lost of encountering others in the midst of confusion and uncertainty. I shall argue that such an attitude towards the lived experience and the lived world might aid in resisting obstetric violence. I argue that a medical system that even partially, even critically adopts the idea of disorientation as a space in which it is possible to linger and that incorporates other important reflections on the potential of illness offered by creep phenomenology, might thereby become better equipped to deal with the grotesque birthing body, and less prone to attempt to tame or control it through violence. 
This attitude could also help birthing subjects to embrace their own disorient disoriented birthing body instead of fearing it, and as a consequence, becoming complicit in their own submission to medical objectification. I believe that the introduction of insights from crypt phenomenologies into the field of birth, of birth studies might open up a myriad of new ways of looking at what happens in medicalized birth settings as a consequence of fear and, and, and anxiety in face of the unexpected, the disorienting, the grotesque, and the monstrous. This could offer an important approach, approach to questions regarding trans men and gender non-conforming subjects given birth as well as, for example, disabled laboring bodies, for whom the descriptions of grotesqueness and monstrosity might apply even more strongly than for more mainstream birthing bodies. Obstetric violence toward disabled subjects, trans men and other gender non-conforming subjects given birth has not been investigated. This project shall function as an invaluable opportunity to approach these pressing issues, mainly through the insights provided provided by queer phenomenologists. Another phenomenon that is worth investigating through this prism is that of obstetric violence toward laboring subjects when the fetus is no longer alive. That is people experiencing late miscarriages or undergoing abortions. The presence of a, de of a dead fetus, I hypo hypothesize, redoubles the monstrosity and grotesqueness characteristic of birth. It adds to its liminality and uncanniness and might be responsible for producing even more shame, anxiety, and loathing on the part of both the medical staff and the birthing subject themselves. The attempt to control this might in turn provoke even more blatant violence. <clears throat> the grotesqueness and abnormality of the female body have already been discussed by grotesque theorists and at length by several feminist scholars. Women's bodies have been recognized as paradigmatic of fluidity, viscosity, blurred and leaky limits and boundaries, porosity and contamination, and of liminality in general. Women's bodies are thus always surrounded by shame. Already in her early and classic essay on the monstrous body and, and its place in posthumanism, Schindrick describes the female body as a broken, broken, disruptive body that threatens the masculine subject and is respons re uh, responsible for provoking anxiety by being a transgressive signifier that challenged the norm and the normal. Schildrich writes, women are the non-subject other, the excluded, the embodied, the monstrous. Women's bodies paradigmatically and by elision, women themselves, exemplified an indifference to limits evidenced by such everyday occurrences as menstruation, pregnancy, lactation, and such supposedly characteristic disorders as hysteria. Women are out of control, uncontained, unpredictable, leaky. They are in short, monstrous. Some feminist studies of reproduction and reproductive injustice have discussed the monstrosity of female embodiment as critical for understanding the various wrongs committed against women in medicalized systems dealing with reproductive issues, including in pregnancy and postpartum. However, the specific event of birth has not been thematized, even in works that extensively address women's reproductive bodies and monstrosity, such as Usher's. Thus, the tail research into the grotesqueness of the birthing body and the birthing process is still very much missing. I believe that a specific focus on birth is necessary and will provide new and original insights because I argue that the birthing body is a doubly grotesque body. On the one hand, it is grotesque simply by being female, but in addition to the body acting in, in, in addition in addition, the body acting in birth is replete with grotesqueness, even if we set aside its female character. I believe that this can be the basis for deep research on trans and gender non-conforming birthing people. <clears throat> as, 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 as I said, trans people are considered even more monstrous than women, and birthing redoubles this monstrosity. 
So if the freakish, freakishness of birthing women can be explored and redeemed through, through free phenomenology, that, um, that research might help to construct a safe space or also for other being uh, for other for other birthing people. In order to discuss a birthing body as compatible with grotesqueness and monstrosity, I rely on the vast literature that has demonstrated the laboring subject to be one in which fragmentation, fluidity, excessiveness, confusion, irrationality, dirt, uncanniness, and on the seedability rule. Various studies on the experience of birth show the birthing body as possessing these qualities. And they also show how difficult it is for the medical system and sometimes even for birthing women themselves to properly cope with and react to this embodied experience without shame, without a need to control this body and to manage to art and articulate the experience and the body of birth and without restoring to a clear, rational, unified and unambiguous idea of the subject. Recent studies specifically dealing with disabled birthing bodies are also of great relevance. I rely here to a great degree also in Chadwick's, on Chadwick's illuminating study of birth, of birth experiences as paradigmatic of uncontained subjectivity in which the women who attempt to articulate, uh, to articulate them nevertheless end up restoring to a classic unified subjectivity. This is a very this is a very interesting study because uh, Chadwick, of course, she interviewed these women, and although they they wanted to express like a fragmented subject and such an, an ambivalent experience, they were all the time going back to very uh, binary and very uh, paradigmatic classic uh, subjectivities when they were describing their experiences. After providing support for the idea of birthing, the birthing body as excessive, grotesque, and even monstrous, and thus provoking feelings of shame, powerlessness, and helplessness in the medical staff and birthing women themselves, I plan to use the insights of quick phenomenologies to show how this theoretical framework might help us to embrace the grotesque birthing body, to understand it on its own terms instead of trying to change or control it. Queer phenomenologists, mainly following the work of phenomenologists such as Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, and heavily influenced by the work of Butler and other queer theorists, as well as other theorists advocating for the construction of the myth of the unified self and the healthy body as the ultimate human goal, goal have presented physical and mental illness as productive, emancipatory spaces from which we can learn to aesthetically appreciate the estrangement and uncanniness the misfitness that is characteristic of our existential condition. We are never at home in the world. On predictability and randomness rule, and in our, in our search for security, we construct fictitious entities such as a unified self and an ordered life attempting to make of our future an expected one. Creep phenomenologies take the estrangement brought by illness as an opportunity. Instead of trying to cure illness and abnormality to smooth them over, they look at their epistemic and, and aesthetic emancipatory potential. They see illness and the disorientation within it as paradigmatic of the general uncanniness of the existential condition. La Joy, for example, argues the possibility of losing, and this is a quote, the possibility of losing one's grip on home, on home, on home and anchors the constitutive role of on home likeness, estrangement, contingency, and unpredictability in human experience. These elements are important for our understanding of disorientation in illness. End quote. Far from trying to cure disorientation or normalize our lost subjectivities. Crip phenomenology suggests that these features are precisely what sustain human relations. The intersubjective relations of care and neutral protection necessarily derive from the recognition of vulnerability and disorientation, even if they clearly do not constitute the only response to those, given that people also respond to disorientation and uncanniness with oppression and violence meant to abolish those uncomfortable states, states of course. However, we can argue in favor of an ethical responsibility to respond to disorientation with compassion. <clears throat> Thus, this project aims to help create not spaces where birthing bodies, women's and others will be oriented, 
but rather spaces that will be supportive of the experience and expression of such disorientations. <clears throat> Looking at the disorientation that is characteristic of labor in bodies and that accompanies the viewing of the experience of birth with awe instead of with fear and repulsion, may, I argue, bring about significant changes in how the medicalized systems and birthing women relate to birth, hopefully contributing to a consciousness raising about both obstetric violence and the complicity of birthing women in their own submission, as well as about why and how to resist both of these phenomena. Thank you.